Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lisa Cuevas Shaw. I'm with the Center for Open Science, and I'm delighted to be moderating today's panel session on reforming science institutions. Uh, the purpose of this session, as you can see from the program, we have a number of more progressive existing institutions that are reforming their cultures to change reward systems, open their practices, foster collaboration, and accelerate discovery. So this panel is intended to introduce and allow a few leaders of these more progressive um, existing institutions to just discuss the opportunities and challenges that they've experienced as a part of this reform uh, movement and to highlight successes and failures for others to emulate or avoid. Uh, so allow me to introduce everyone. So we have Shell Genteman from NASA. We have Ulrich Dernagel from Charity and the Quest Center for Responsible Biomedical Research at the Berlin Institute of Health in the center, and Mira Scholten, the chair of Utrecht University's Open Science Platform. So please um, join me in welcoming our panelists. So I'll share a little bit about the lineup. Um, when we got together to plan for this session, we wanted to make sure that uh, the presentations went at a pretty fast clip so we could really privilege the nature of a panel discussion. And so as you're hearing everyone speak to essentially three points, what is the scope of their reform? And when we're talking about reform, I should probably at least broadly define it as we are talking about open scholarship and open science. And so each of them will address how they approached um, or how they are approaching that uh, aspect of reform within their institutions. They're going to be describing those opportunities and challenges of the work to date and then highlighting those successes and failures and potentially what's next on the roadmap to amplify successes and avoid failures or pitfalls. And so as you hear them speak, please feel free to start thinking of some questions. After they present for about five to seven minutes each, uh, I will start to offer a few questions, but I welcome everyone to come up to the microphone and, and um, then I'll start to, to pick on folks uh, to share their questions. So without further ado, let me welcome uh, Shell. Thank you, everyone. And I am glad everyone is still awake. Uh, I am here to talk about NASA's year of open science. I'm Shell Geneman. I am the Transform to Open Science lead at NASA headquarters, which is across all of the science mission directorate. Science is the key to unlocking the secrets of the universe. It unifies humanity in asking questions. Science is unifying us, what we measure large and small. And NASA has declared 2023 as a year of open science, joined by 13 other federal agencies representing over 90 billion in science funding. You can find out more about that at open.science.gov. We're really here to build with the open science community, and that's one thing that I want to emphasize. As NASA comes into joining the open science movement, we do really see ourselves as joining an existing movement. There have been decades of work in open science developing the infrastructures, the protocols, and the practices that allow and enable a federal agency to come in with that visibility to an existing community that is developed and is powerful, and we want to recognize and have respect for that. One thing that the federal agencies for a year of open science have come together is to agree on a definition of open science for the federal agencies. And this is growth out of the many different existing definitions of open science. And we see it as sort of an evolution of process, right? As we start doing open science, we say, well, open science is open data, or open science is public access. We really want to 
emphasize how open science as we see it has grown and transformed as a concept and how important it is for it to be equitable open science. So the definition is the principle and practice of making research products and processes available to all while respecting diverse cultures, maintaining security and privacy, and fostering collaborations, reproducibility, and equity. And so within this definition, what we have is a recognition that open science isn't just the final product. It's what goes into that final product. It's the principles, it's the practice, it's how you do your science, it's who you engage with and how you do inclusive, equitable science. And it's respecting diverse cultures, it's maintaining privacy with this goal, with this goal of increasing collaborations, reproducibility and equity. So within NASA, we're putting open science into practice. We have four areas that we're working in, and this is NASA's open source science initiative. And we've called it open source to sort of build on that collaborative energy that open source software development has. This year, it's $30 million. It increases to $50 million for the next years out, pending appropriations. So with those, we have policy. NASA has updated, they've coalesced all of the existing scientific information policy into a very exciting new document called SPD 41. I did not have any input on the naming of that. And that takes all the information policies that were scattered around NASA, brings them together, and then that was then iterated on. And SPD-41A, again, I wasn't consulted, was released, which actually starts to require, instead of shoulds, that policy is full of shalls around open science. You shall share your data at the time of publication. You shall share your software. You should apply a permissive open license. You shall publish open access. And this is for forward-looking policy. So that development, that publication, that work, that's part of this. We're also developing the infrastructure, investing in data repositories, in software development, investing in core services that help the computational infrastructure that we need to do science. We're also funding, we have funding opportunities for open source software tools, libraries, and the core infrastructure that has so far been limping along with funding here and there. As a federal agency, we want to recognize the importance of all of that primarily volunteer work within the open science community and start to fund that at a federal level. And then we have the community. So this is the Transform to Open Science mission, and this is our outreach and working with the existing open science community and building new bridges to our new open science community. So community engagement, this is where we're trying to work with both our existing scientists and broadening participation in science. It's a $40 million, five-year mission to accelerate adoption of open science. It has three goals, to support 20,000 researchers to earn a NASA open science certification. This is a digital certification that goes with your resume, it goes on your LinkedIn, and we see this as really valuable, especially to early career researchers, to motivate them to learn about open science. To double the participation of historically excluded groups across NASA science, and to enable five major discoveries. And we're doing this by creating an open science curriculum, by doing outreach and efforts with historically excluded groups. And we have sessions at many of the national society meetings in 2023, which is why it's really hard to get hold of me right now. This is really exciting. We have the Open Science 101, which is a community-developed introduction to open science with inclusivity, accessibility, and diversity at the forefront. If you get out your phone, you can scan the QR code. That'll actually prompt you if you want to sign up for the email list. It'll send you information about where our GitHub repository is. We have discussions enabled, and we really want to have as many of these discussions and these questions about open science in the public. And we want to hear from you, from the community, what are we doing right, what are we doing wrong, and how can we support the open science community? Thank you. And here's... Thank you, Ulrich from Quest. 
Yeah, thank you very much for um, the opportunity to talk a little bit about the Quest Center in Berlin. Um, it's uh, what we would uh, like to call a complex and systemic behavior change intervention in a academic biomedical center. Um, the quest consists of roughly 50 very enthusiastic people from very different fields and at different uh, career stages. We, we are very happy to um, have uh, from our institution about 2.5 million per year in funds. That does not include um, third party funding. And to give you an idea about the ecosystem in which we want to afford this um, culture change, actually, uh, just two numbers. These are about 5,000 researchers and 8,000 students, and it's probably the largest medical university uh, center in Europe. Um, our work is based on a framework which, uh, when we started, we gave us. Um, we basically start from three principles. Um, we, we posit that uh, the advancement of knowledge, in our case of biomedical knowledge, of course, needs to be trustworthy, which we define as robust and rigorous, um, needs to be useful. That is, of course, uh, useful for scientists, but also for society. And it needs to be ethical to humans, but uh, in this realm also, of course, for animals, because there are a lot of animal experiments going on. Um, these principles, we believe, are underpinned by processes, and um, they are obviously context-specific. In our particular case, for example, um, they include um, things like randomization blinding to make work trustworthy, or pre-registration timely reporting to make it useful for scientists, or um, uh, patient-relevant outcomes and patient uh, uh, engagement for society. Um, and ethical, uh, I guess it's quite clear, it's about risk-benefit analysis, it's about data protection, protection for animals, it's about the three R's. And so if you have these processes, and that was just a, a list of, uh, of those processes, um, we um, then uh, have uh, selected activities uh, to underpin them. We group them, or you could group them into competences that we are trying to bring in or motivation that we want to create uh, and opportunities. And I'll have just a few examples in a second. Importantly, we are accompanying this with uh, meta-research um, to uh, find areas uh, in which we um, should become active and maybe even more importantly areas uh, or act to um, investigate how um, what the impact um, of our uh, activities is to possibly adjust them. These are just a few um, examples um, of our approaches. Um, so we are um, helping our researchers with quality assurance, just two examples. We are providing electronic laboratory notebooks to all of them and, and help them use them. Um, error management in clinical practice, just another example. Education, I guess it's quite obvious what, what this entails. In terms of open science, um, we are helping our researchers with uh, fair open data, research data management plans, uh, data management plans, um, and so forth. Um, key to all this, I believe, is to change the reward and incentive structure. Um, we are happy that our leadership is pretty much uh, aligned with all those things, and so we were, for example, able um, to um, adopt uh, narrative uh, CVs on, or narratives um, in the uh, promotion and tenure committees with, for example, a specific narrative on open science practices. Um, uh, we have rewards uh, and, um, uh, and special, um, so, so we, we are, uh, if, if a researcher at the Charité, uh, for example, has open data, we reward it with uh, a little bit of money for extra money for research and so forth. Um, in this realm, very important is uh, we find is to uh, engage our patients in the type of research we, d we do, uh, clinical trials, uh, not just as subjects, but also in the uh, design of uh, the clinical trials, um, de defining the outcomes and so forth. And we are helping with our researchers and clinicians to do this. I have to say that Germany is actually a, quite a diaspora uh, in this, and, and we are way behind, for example, where Britain is um, in, this, in this topic. 
And I already mentioned it, we do meta research, and you could also call it implementation research on those things that we do. And we act as a think tank because um, uh, we have been, I think, we have had quite some success, so other institutions are now trying to uh, find out what we are doing, and obviously we're um, keen to help them. Um, I was asked to um, not only talk uh, and brag about what we have achieved, but, but also um, mention barriers and, and challenges, and, and as you can imagine, there are many of them. Um, I just uh, chose the top three ones for me. Um, a very important one, I think, is that the brains of our scientists and a and, uh, large part of the leadership and the administrators are what I believe, and that's of course through um, socialization, but they are almost hardwired to, equi to equate the impact and even purpose of their research with journal reputation and third party funding. It's very hard to, to get this out of their brains. Um, you can argue that responsible research is actually a state of mind, but it needs uh, additional resources, and we are happy that we can provide those. This is a very special situation. Uh, no other institution in Germany has, has the, the, these funds available. Um, so this is nice. But on the other hand, so what we are doing basically is we are, we are piloting uh, a lot of activities and then to get them in a line function to make them sustainable is, is quite a challenge um, because uh, then the, even the resources that we have are not sufficient and this would bind our resources to just maintaining where we are and not um, getting uh, uh, further. Um, and so I guess that's uh, a, a problem that many of us are facing that um, uh, get money from foundations, for example, to, to start a project, but then when it comes to making it uh, permanent, um, uh, everyone's looking away. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much also for your uh, invitation to speak here today. Um, uh, I'm Mira Scholte, I'm a, a associate professor at the Utrecht University and also a chair of the UU Open Science Platform. So today I'm actually talking on behalf of my, all of my colleagues. We are approximately already 250 people at the whole university dealing with different topics of open science. So I'm presenting on their behalf. Um, so uh, my short in intervention is going to be about what open science is at Utrecht University and the purposes or the aims that we try to achieve, opportunities and challenges and the progress so far and the way forward. Now, uh, what is open science at the Utrecht University? Well, very shortly, it's a program uh, uh, which is uh, there, and I think, uh, um, listening today to different presentations, I think we actually mean lots of different things when we talk about open science. So I try to <laughs> define it briefly. So open science started, uh, perhaps, it's, and it's still oftentimes, uh, uh, the, the word is oftentimes changed, um, interchangeably used with open access but there's much more to it. So we define it broadly. We define open access, uh, sharing uh, data and software, public engagement, open education, and the system of rewards and recognition for that. So this is how I mean it. And why we do it that? Uh, well, at least, and these are the key purposes. Uh, first of all, promoting more, but not <laughs> quantity, but quality in research. And I don't know how it's, you know, about your uh, uh, expertise or, or discipline, but uh, what I do is uh, law and economics, political science, and um, governance studies. So when I search for some articles, especially I remember when I started my PhD to do that, I felt like, you know, in this, the, all the way to the picture <laughs> to the, I don't know, left for you. Uh, it's a lot of articles, you're getting lost there, and uh, uh, it's, you know, it's a lot to handle. And, and what I nowadays value a lot, and sometimes is a few review articles, just literature review what has been there, what has been said, and how to move on. And this is what I'm trying to uh, also contribute with my research. So not more necessarily articles and publications, but different things, databases, blogs, vlogs, or review articles, and, you know, really trying to move forward. Promoting scientific innovation is our next uh, 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 aim in research and education. And of course, it's not possible just to do it on your own. If you need 
uh, uh, 20 years to get a database to, to really uh, get something moving. So it would be a pity if I would be also spending another 20 years to get to that data. So we need each other. We need to promote scientific innovation, and that's only together together in terms of uh, uh, different um, scholars together, but also disciplines. And last but not least, we believe that science is there also to make the society better. Well, like with an invention of the light bulb. It helps <laughs> to educate the whole society, right? Now, um, is it all going uh, smoothly? Uh, no, of course, there are opportunities and challenges to each of these purposes. So I try to put it really uh, in brief here, so promoting quality, yes, it gives us an opportunity to rethink, establish, and establish what actually quality should be in the 21st century. Uh, we're living in a digital world uh, with lots of technological and other challenges. It needs to be rethink, rethought, but as my challenge, what I've uh, uh, come across so far, nobody likes change. Everybody wants immediately the menu, this is the new quality criteria. No, we're not there yet, but that's the discussion that we are going to take, and it takes a while. Promoting innovation, um, I think it's, it's a great idea to share publication, data, everything openly to, you know, to improve the progress. But we are stuck well with the ideas, if I'm going to share data with you and you're going to be promoted tomorrow, that's not an incentive that I would like to have, so I'm not going to share and that system needs to be changed. But also unfair competition sometimes and knowledge security against the big tech, geopolitical uh, situation at this moment, etc. And last but not least, it's very, it's opportunity <laughs> to have a, a stakeholders together, co-creation, agenda setting, but there is also debate somewhere uh, from behind pure science and danger. No, I, I, in my opinion, open science is for everybody, but not only science for science. Now, our progress so far, um, we've been there for quite a while, since 2017. Uh, we've done the first run of the program. Uh, this year we are finishing up, and actually from the next year we hope to embed it in our daily work life. So, you know, it's like uh, doing a reference list at the end of your publication. Yes, you just go with the stakeholders' engagement or something like this. So it should be normal to your life. It shouldn't be a bubble, a program, or oh, that community, those guys in open science program, we are not. No, it should be our daily uh, work life. But, of course, it's also uh, something that you can, you know, cherry and pick in a sense that what suits you. No, not everybody has to go and do the stakeholder engagement. Also, if it's just personally doesn't fit you, you can blog, vlog, you can have a small meetings with those who you work for, etc. Um, we have developed a number of principles in our promotion system, so we, we've established a new assessment and development cycle. Each year you get to your boss and you are developed and assessed and at the end getting promoted according to the triple model, what we call. So basically it's we promote team leadership and impact in the three primarily tasks that we are doing, research, education, professional performance. And our approach is holistic, so it's all those themes that I told, talked to you about, open access, but also with good data, reliable data, uh, engagement with the public or relevant stakeholders to make science for society, uh, doing open education, and, and actually also uh, educating the new professionals in that direction with the relevant recognition reward system in the Netherlands, within the European Union, well, and hopefully with the world. Um, I have, I'm running out of time, so if you have any questions also on the <laughs> pictures, I will be happy to respond to those uh, in the question and answer session. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? It's on? Okay, good. Excellent. Okay, so um, if you have any questions, please queue up. I'm going to kick us off, actually. I think one of the things that we talked about when we were preparing for this panel, uh, first of all, it, it shouldn't go without saying, just to point out, we, we tried to get some diversity in terms of institutional representation. So we have U.S. federal agency. We have, obviously, um, Berlin Institute for Health and Quest Center, very different, unique kind of um, circumstance. And then I'll say in air quotes, more traditional university um, situation, but, but certainly there are certain dynamics to that. 
But the other thing that we talked about was just the fact that um, all of these are, are fairly well supported and funded. So I just want to say that, that that's we make that acknowledgement um, as a group that that's not always the case. And if there are questions about that, we should raise those as well in the discussion. So the first question I have, and, and I'll um, maybe throw it, lob it over to Shell, is one that's related really to implementation. It's implementation-oriented. I guess the question, you, you know, you, you have a fair amount of funding, but you still had to make choices in terms of priorities. And as you've kicked things off, uh, we've talked about the fact that there are resource and investment trade-offs in any reform effort. And so can you describe, um, you know, for the group here, what are the resource and investment trade-offs to consider when implementing this kind of reform? Um, what have they been uh, within the NASA kind of paradigm? Yeah, I think one of the first uh, really important lessons that I had going into this project was from other uh, people in leadership positions at federal agencies who had been responsible for programs. And the first thing that they told me was, they will love to give you a title, but you have to fight for a budget. So don't accept a position without a budget because then you won't be able to do anything meaningful. So the first thing was just getting a budget. Uh, luckily, NASA has high-level support for this initiative, and uh, this sort of came into that, what had already been thought of as an existing budget, and so we came into this with a budget, and we had to make some decisions about uh, what we would be investing in, and what we did is we did a lot of community outreach. And we were doing a lot of community forums, talking to everyone who would talk to us. And through that outreach process, listening to the community about what the needs were is really how we came to developing this outreach, this curriculum, and the main areas that we're working in. So we heard, we want more visibility, we want more support. So we decided we're going to invest in communications so that we can provide high-level cover, high-level support, so people aren't afraid to take what is a risk. Uh, next, we heard, we don't know how to do this. You can't ask us to do this and not support that journey. So we're developing a curriculum for this. Uh, we also heard there aren't any incentives in place. How can you ask us to do this if we're going to not get tenure? And we've heard earlier today about professors who struggled with tenure. So we're working really hard to announce new incentives in open science this year. And uh, then finally, they wanted to see coordination among the agencies so that if they had some rules that they were following at one agency, they wanted it to be easy to, impl to apply to multiple agencies and not have to reinvent or rewrite sections of their proposal to, because NSF had something different than NASA, which had something different than NOAA. So trying to, and that's where the year of, a year of open science, that coordination on the federal agencies came from. So you really, I mean, in terms of those investment choices, it sounds like you really relied on the community. Yeah. Um, was there, were there any hard choices at the outset in terms of those potential trade-offs or things that, or matter of timing? At the beginning of a project, you often have more ideas than you have, but you also have funding because you haven't committed any of it. So I'm right at the point now, I've spent all my money and I feel like a hungry hippo just trying to get more so that I can fund because there's, the you can't put enough money into open science right now. I think we're at a, a moment in history where if we really lean into this, we can transform to a more equitable, inclusive scientific future. So right now I am having to make hard choices about what particular things within that portfolio I can support now and what I have to push for a year or two. I don't know if you want to comment on, because we've had a little bit of a chat on trade-offs. What, what has that been like, or what have you observed at Quest as you've ramped up this reform effort? Well, we were very lucky that the institution, the, there was a moment when uh, we could uh, secure this, this type of funding, which was kind of a, a gift from heaven, in a way. Um, 
and uh, this is now baked into the into the institution, so we ha we don't have to fight for it. Um, and the number was someone made it up. Uh, in fact, I was when when I was uh, trying to convince them that we need an in, uh, an initiative like this, I uh, I was much more humble because I didn't think that uh, there's so much money in the system. But they they said, well, okay, 2.5 million, and I didn't complain. But um, now we are learning, and that I, I already indicated this that uh, and that's the hungry hippo, I guess. Um, <laughs> if um, it, it needs a lot of it needs a lot of money, um, and uh, the, but we are now, I think, well equipped to to pilot a few things. Um, but once they are working, and we have some confidence in that we are going in the right direction, take for example research data management. This should be done by an institution and not by a special group that has these these fancy ideas. It should be part of the, the what what the institution provides to its researchers. And then you have to scale it up, 8,000 researchers. Uh, we, we now have one person doing it, but for 8,000 researchers, you would need, I don't know, 10. Um, and then, of course, uh, they are not so happy with our suggestions. So, I, And that's really a, a, a big, big problem, I think, um, because we get a lot of exposure. They, 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 the leadership is pointing at us. They are proud. They, they are bragging. Uh, when they are with colleagues from other universities, um, but this is just for these for these uh, special activities. And, and once it gets it's no longer that exciting, but routine, then uh, so uh, I guess that's that goes very deep. Uh, the the only response to this in the end, and that's why I think it's a very uh, very big problem is. Um, it, it, it touches, at least in Germany, um, um, with the financing of the universities. And universities in Germany are underfinanced. This is a state financing system of universities. And it, the, the financing is extremely tight. And if you come with something new, they tell you, well, we can do it, but then we have to get rid of something else. And then you, a lot of hands are going up and, no, no, not my, not my thing. So, um, to, to make to, to really scale up what we are doing in Germany at least we would need a reform of, of the anti university system well that that's actually a great segue and this is a, is getting a little bit more to the meta level or combination of meta and, and implementation but um, maybe to Mira what have you learned thus far about scaling up and sustaining the efforts that that you have at Utrecht uh, yeah, I would say three things. Um, first of all, uh, is getting started. <laughs> I think any of us, if you, you know, try to go sporting or give up smoking, I think it's the first thing is difficult is to start. Once you've started, it's kind of already becomes the, the, the part of your uh, daily job. It becomes, we have it in the strategic plan of the university. Uh, for the next years as well. We have it now in, in our research evaluation. We just had a number of uh, programs at different faculties evaluated by external research group, which has followed our approach. So it becomes kind of a normal thing to do. Um, the second one is communication. And it's, it's funny, uh, uh, thing that uh, you already talked about how important it is to invest in there. But the funny thing is what I see the most effective is when you communicate really to people. Um, many times you meet someone at, uh, I don't know, New Year's drinks, <laughs> a colleague you haven't seen for in the corona times, and then, oh yeah, open science, and it's, sometimes it's still vague, and, and oh, is it just publishing openly? And once you just said a few things, like, no, it's about actually quality innovation and, and, and getting, you know, the why of, of your doing anything, then becomes so clear, and then, oh, you know, and then they pass it through. So it's very important also this personal contact from the people involved, uh, and hearsay. <laughs> and the last one, at least, uh, I think support, and also in terms of uh, not putting it as an oblige, you know, top-down, okay, tomorrow we are Open Science University, these are the things, you know, 
the Czech uh, uh, list uh, uh, to do. No, um, it's actually uh, uh, going to the relevant people, especially the, the, the leaders of research group, education institutions, etc. And that they actually talk with their people, so what are you doing? Why are you doing it? And what support do you need to do that? Because I've run my cell phone project for students. Um, I call it the Not Waste Students Research Recycle. So we've um, have done. So what can you do with your papers? You know, of research students. It's it's a pity that it goes all to the archive and basically to the bin. You know, a garbage bin. Um, so oh, once we've done our idea, I decided to check the whole university. So you know, what are people doing with their students? And we found at least thirty initiatives, just already people, teachers doing that within different faculties, disciplines, etc. So it's not like we are not doing it, it's actually making it more explicit and giving them necessarily support to the things that we are already sometimes doing without even knowing. Yeah. That's great. I want to dig in and I want to make sure there aren't any questions. Okay. You mentioned just the um, research evaluation, you know, a promotion tenure, you know, that's been a topic that's come up a little bit. But can you describe a little bit more how that change process was? Because that always seems like a, a tremendous obstacle with uh, that can be politicized, very entrenched. What was that process like, or has has that process been like? Well, we're still in the process, right. I must say. <laughs> I must say, uh, but it's it's moving. And uh, uh, what we've done so far is first, well, define these elements that we want to use in our sort of annual talks with uh, all the employees. We've uh, decided to skip the, the division of academic and support staff because it was kind of, you know, and also there is a the whole debate also within the Netherlands about um, everybody is a professor. So it doesn't mean assistant, associate, full professor. Everybody could use the title prof as a professor in specific circumstances, etc. This is still a debate. In. Uh, but what we are trying to do is that, um, first of all, to put this system as a sort of a development cycle. It's not like tomorrow everybody is a professor and it's not realistic and you don't even want that. You want to develop, you want to find things uh, uh, in your daily work, what you like and what you think, hmm, I could you know, study a bit more about it, etc. So develop yourself, so these are the things that we are inputting now into place and the next step is to you know, how it's going to be promoted into this different, you know, it's, I always call it the new wine into the old bottles of the three divisions which we have in the Netherlands, assistant, associate, full professor. And at this moment, we actually, I mean, it's, uh, it will be announced in July, <laughs> so I'm not allowed to say that yet. But we are <laughs> getting to, to uh, some reforms uh, to get rid of some of the, you know, complexities, how to get from one to another. But um, it, it takes a while, a lot of discussion, and um, sometimes debates, differences within the disciplines. Is it really true? I'm not sure, actually. But uh, yeah, it's, it takes time. OK, who was first? OK, right over here. I'm Veronique Kirmer with, with PLOS. Thank you very much for these presentations. And uh, I guess my question is probably for the, the Europeans who are on the, on the stage. I mean, you've both described very uh, impressive programs in your, in your universities, and I gather that you both benefit from um, strong support from leadership of, of the university. And, and I'm contrasting that in my head with what we heard this morning about the, uh, I don't know how to characterize it, but the, uh, the state that we have in, in, in the US, and in particular with, you know, I mean, we heard this this point that we have two U.S. universities that have signed DORA. Uh, I don't know how many there are in the Netherlands and in Germany, but I'm sure it's way more than that. And and so, um, so my question to you is more about how do you how do you think about the efforts that you are you leading at your university, and how can that spread within your national or European context? Because I think what we hear a lot from leadership of American universities is that it's a collective action problem. Nobody wants to be the first to do it, and then, and then actually, if we want to change culture, it's very difficult, because of the movement of researchers and all that, it's very difficult to change culture in only one place. It's not going to be very efficient if it doesn't change elsewhere. And so, how are you thinking about the scaling, not within your university, but but across the, the higher education system in, in, in your country? 
Thank you. Question. Thank you, Veronique. Who wants to? Maybe I can start ahead. by uh, first of all congratulating the Netherlands because I think you have a national plan. Sort of you, the universities, as I understand, universities, academies, the uh, the ministry, they they all came together. So this is the perfect breeding ground for for scaling it up nationally. So you're you're in a in an excellent situation there. Um, in Germany, um, I think we have big hopes. Uh, to the Quara process, which is a European Union-led initiative. In fact, they, the European Union has started it, but now it's, it's, it's spreading in, into a, a participatory uh, thing of, of universities, funders, and so forth. Um, and I think this, or I should say, I hope that this will be very helpful uh, in this regard. It's, it's a little bit like DORA, but it goes way beyond DORA. Um, touches upon all the elements of um, assessing researchers. And I think this can be, or I hope, again, I have to say, I hope that this will be very powerful um, uh, if now more institutions are signing this. So our institution has signed it, others are signing it now too. Um, and um, that, to me, is the process, I think, where this uh, collective uh, movement actually uh, can take place because now you can point to others they are doing it we are doing it um, and so we will see over the next few years i think that's that's again a process that will take time but over the next years uh, i think uh, we will see some progress um, because leadership looks at those things the funders are picking it up the european union has is already very strong on these things uh, local funders at least in germany are starting to to take note at least um, because it's coming from this uh, high level of the European Commission and of the funders of Europe. So that would be my, my hope how we are going to uh, scale this up. Now, just to add, I would congratulate also the US uh, on this, at least already starting with the Open Science Year. <laughs> I think it's already uh, getting here. Um, and honestly, from my own research on, on compliance with laws and policies, on the one hand, yes, you need this uh, top-down approach, the policy, the money, uh, the, the, the law or whatever. And it is helpful indeed in the Dutch um, system. We even have it nowadays in the cabinet of uh, agreement that uh, we invest in open science and we need to have a new recognition and, um, and reward system. At the same time, please don't forget there are different levels of the reform. So that could take a while, but it is still already happening if we are here today, I, I guess. But there is also a very important level of, of individual researchers and, and individual collaborations. I mean, nothing stops you um, of thinking, okay, why am I doing something that what I am doing? Uh, I was also once, you know, when I was <laughs> finished my PhD, I was checking 200 case notes uh, of students all the same, you know, and some points they were so nicely written case notes and I really thought, wow, it's a pity that it goes away. So I decided to start this project and I collaborated with others who liked the idea. So, I mean, for me, it's part of open science. It's just make or adding purpose to my work, to my daily work. And what I've done is that I started to reward those students who write nice uh, case notes and ask him then to put it to a Wikipedia page to build up societal knowledge and they get an extra bonus point for their grade. I mean, and this makes also fun for yourself because students are also interacting and they see it differently, etc. So there are I mean, different levels where you want to achieve it, but also don't forget about yourselves, I guess. I just want to add that there is a coalition of over 90 universities in the US. It's called Helios. And if your university isn't part of it, you might consider advocating for them to join. But this is to advocate and advance open science at universities. Uh, there's several open science project office, and there's also, there was just a call from a philanthropic organization to do more open science offices at universities. So there is, there's a lot going on in Europe and the US, I think. And if your university isn't part of it, advocate for them to do so. I just to call out Veronique the point of a lot of times in reform you don't there's the I don't want to be first right especially when there's a lot at stake at, at that institutional level so I think it's a, a very good call out so thank you Brian 
Brian Nosek, Center for Open Science. My question's about project management. Uh, to what extent have you adopted traditional project management strategies of well-specified goals and implementation plans in advance versus more agile strategies where the goals and implementation is responsive to what's happening on the ground? And why do you regret not choosing the other one? Thank you. <laughs> Um, I, I can just start. I mean, we have uh, various various ways of uh, dealing with these things that we're doing with these projects. Um, in some, we have a, a clear um, theory of action, which I think then dictates a, a, a full program in a way, and also an assessment and monitoring of, of, of checkpoints within the program. Um, and it's an evaluation that is formative, so we are kind of in a circle of, of while we are evaluating, we are changing our um, uh, what we are doing. Some of what we are doing, I think, is done more agile, or I could say that that's a fancy word of saying it's done ad hoc, um, because um, there are opportunities that that are popping up in terms of funding. There are opportunities popping up in terms of people who are suddenly. I mean, there are positions that change in a university. So you. And, and your theory of action may not yet <laughs> include this. So um, it, I think we are, in a way, I think we are pretty opportunistic uh, in, in how we are trying to achieve what we, are, what, we are, what we can do. It's a mix, I would say. We've started off with one page, then objectives, then goals, then key performance indicators. We're doing risk analysis. So we're doing a more traditional project management approach. Uh, and. That is in part because we're within NASA and there's very formal guidelines about what a project is, how it is organized, how it is run, how it's implemented. And while we were more agile at the beginning as we were developing, it's becoming more formalized as it goes into it, in part because of the way that government funding is organized and the way these projects are spun up. And in some ways, the speed that they're able to move with is far, far less agile than I ever would have anticipated. Uh, so there's some adjustments going on. <laughs> and if you ask me in a year, I'll have a better answer as to how this is working out. Um, it's, it's a struggle to do something this unconventional within a conventional agency, but I'm glad I'm doing it within NASA, which has so many tools about risk assessment and being able to agile respond to new information, especially when you're developing missions, that that, I think, is helping our project. I think to add for us, I, I guess it's also both, and you just split the, the, ter uh, the terms, so short-term goal, mid-term, long-term, and a short-term goal also because of the funding, you need to be a bit more specific, but then it's open-ended because you still have to define uh, what is now public engagement. It took two years for our group of representatives of all faculties to really write an open access paper of what public engagement should be, could be, etc. So it's, it's open afterwards. Now we just reform into the next stage of the program. Uh, so I guess it's, it's, it's both, and the why you wouldn't regret that you asked. Well, it's not regretting, but I think it just fits what we are doing as transition. So you cannot be, you know, very strict as any research grant application as well. You, you think you're moving to A, it could be B at the end, as long as you can justify. It's, it's also scientific discovery, so it's a transition process, so I think it needs this kind of approach. Yes. Wonderful contributions in the talks that you've given. Um, thinking about this a little bit more, and like, you know, I think I'm, I'm, I'm in the of uh, what Shell said is essentially like open science seems to be all of these cool new things. We have like technology, we have collaboration, we have diversity, equity, inclusion, all of the things I think Shell like really summarizes nicely. All of the things that we all want and that we all think is cool. But while we can spend like $8 billion to shoot a James Webb Space Telescope into space and operate it, we don't seem to be able to find really the money to do the transformation that would help us all. And so my question is, is the problem maybe not our transformation to open science, 
but that science or the way we practice is, is fundamentally not collaborative and that we're not only trying to transform to open science, but that we are trying to do a more foundational transformation of science itself. I'm sorry if I stumped that. No, no, no. That's good. Is it for all of us or? Uh, Whoever would. I mean, I think it would be an interesting discussion. Why is something that we all clearly want so difficult to fund? Because transition takes time and the mindset difference, I think. It's not just, you know, putting the law into practice and then thinking that tomorrow there is going to be 100% uh, compliance. As what I said, you know, we've, we've, we've issued beautiful working papers on the new recognition and reward system a few years ago. And then two, three years later, I mean, it was the corona years, but okay, still, it was all online, you could read it. I met colleagues at the professor level who were, you know, still wondering. So it's really important to communicate, to discuss at a very individual level, because each of us, we are uh, situated in a particular school, within a particular discipline, sometimes a particular method of working. And not that many people ask themselves a question on a daily basis, why is it so? Is that okay? No, we think, oh, we, <laughs> we just go with the flow. And this takes time. I must say, so far, um, and I invite people to talk to me also against, like, hey, I would like to see the, the counter arguments. Um, and I'd like to, to get into those debates, but um, people just, you know, need time. And when they hear more and more about it, they start thinking, uh, trying to see to what extent it could apply to their situation, to their uh, group, research group, etc. Yeah, I think that that's my experience so far. Just but, but, time. But can I challenge your assumption that we all want it? I mean, <laughs> all in this room want it, but I guess a big problem is that not everyone wants it. Or so uh, that's that. That I think is is, is a big uh, a big hurdle here because uh, we we need to on the one hand convince others that they really want it. We need to demonstrate actually that this para these paradigms that we are preaching partially, I mean, I'm partially preaching to <laughs> you, is, is really worth it and that, that we are, that, that we need to create evidence that, that this paradigm changes uh, all those things that we are actually, uh, we believe uh, a lot of, a lot of, for a lot of the uh, things that we are discussing here, they are extremely plausible. Um, and there are also very plausible ways how we get there, but uh, in the end, uh, we have to demonstrate that this is actually true. So um, uh, it's, it's not only about money, I guess, although I have brought up the money issue, I think. It's more about the mindset. I, I would also say that we have an opportunity. I think that it hasn't... There was a lot of activity around open science around a decade ago, and it, there was a lot of financial investment, especially within Europe, and it didn't take off. Uh, I think, I hope that this is different now, and I think it's different in part because of the advances in the cyber infrastructure and the ability, the tools. I just don't think it was quite ready. I don't think it was mature enough. You know, I can publish an interactive notebook and share my entire workflow, including the data, in about 10 minutes now. And that was not possible even five years ago. Uh, so I think the infrastructure is there. And if we're taking this opportunity, I also think we're at a moment in time where if we're going to reimagine how we do science, we need to reimagine who's doing science with us, who's in the room, and who's at the table. And we have a chance to create a more equitable, inclusive future. And I think that's also part of why it's resonating more with people now, is that addition of the equity component. Because so many of us, for various reasons, have been on the outside looking in. And it doesn't feel great. And we have an opportunity now to not just invite people into the room, but actually just change our definition of the room to make it so that everyone has a sense of belonging. And I think that's really important when we look at what we want out of the next decade as we move into open science. I think he was up. Next? Oh, yeah. You're kind. Okay. 
Hi, Mari Malicki from uh, Stanford University. If I can provide a little bit more data on that, um, 90 institutions, as you said, signed Helios, but there's more than 4,000 in the United States. And when it comes to Quara, only 500 signed up Quara right now, and there's more than 14,000, so we're not even close to 10% of institutions following this. But my question here was for you, for those who are actually implementing changes, how did you manage to balance the diversity and inclusion opposed to open science. We've seen reports that only 10% of faculty in the United States are the ones that haven't completed their PhD in the United States. And in Europe, reports seem to be less than that, that the um, faculty who haven't completed their PhDs within that country has gotten those positions. So is it more important that we are advancing hiring and, and tenure promotions for the open science practices rather than diversity and inclusion practices? I think that they're reinforcing. I don't think you have to choose one or the other. I think they're mutually reinforcing. And if you do things in an open, inclusive way, you'll achieve your diversity. And you do it thoughtfully with design, using evidence-based approach. We saw the picture with the spaghetti earlier. Uh, if you were in that talk, it was very engaging. Um, but I think you can have both. And I agree, You know, we're, maybe we're only at 10%. But this is actually a really good place, I think, to be at right now. And again, this is a year of open science. This is the start of building out what will become a new era. Uh, well, so far what we have been doing is that um, we have quite a, an umbrella of issue on the open science at the Utrecht University. So, um, what we've done so far is trying to also, you know, find focus within, you know, specific areas. So open access, we have actually achieved the goals that we've done, I think, quite uh, already uh, very well. So we find it really like a successful uh, project. Um, a few publishers only, especially for the native language which is still a sort of a negotiation stage, but for the rest, we are really happy. So we are kind of doing the step-by-step -step approach and diversity inclusion, it's not like, it's not under the umbrella, but it's one of the issues that we have discussed, for instance, in our promotion recognition and reward system. And there is a, a huge debate uh, about also actually the fact or the sort of uh, question mark. If it is necessary for a scholar to be successful, to be, uh, moving around uh, to, you know, experience different uh, research um, uh, institutions, uh, different cultures, especially within the European Union, where we also want to uh, have a free movement of, 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 of people, etc. So, I mean, I don't have an answer yet. It's part of the debate, but not necessarily at this moment. It's not necessarily our main focus, but it's certainly not included, and it's, it's certainly in a debate how to integrate, especially international uh, EU citizens <laughs> with us a lot, uh, into the, 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 the promotion system. And at our university, I think we, I mean, I work at the Department of International European Law, the Faculty of Law, Economics and Governance, and we, I think we are very international. Okay, we'll take one last question. We got started a little bit late, so we'll take one more, and then we'll do kind of a one-minute wrap-up. Uh, hi, I'm Hao Yi from University of Florida. I want to take back on the point about the, the telescope, and um, it reminded me of this article recently about how Google constantly develops new products, and then they discontinue them, and it's because you can get promoted and recognition for building new and shiny things, but they, you don't get promoted and rewarded for maintaining them after they've been created. So I, I'm kind of curious about kind of the thoughts of the panel on moving forward, what your, you know, perceived to be the challenges and maybe opportunities in sustaining uh, transformation and reform. If, if I may, uh, um, well, in, in the, this whole debate of the last five years or something when I'm there, uh, the system of uh, recognition and reward is not the same as the promotion. And that 
we have had a lot of discussion about it. So um, uh, it's not like I'm not, I, I mean, I'm a social professor. Uh, would I like to be a full professor? Yes, of course. Uh, is it now uh, recognition and reward? Not necessarily 100% for me, because I'd rather be recognized for bringing a good idea, uh, for you know being cited, being invited to talk about my topic, etc. Then I feel really recognized, rather than simply putting the, the title before me. Although it would make me a bit perhaps happier, I would say. So it's not exactly the same. And what we are looking for is how to make people incentivized to do good research. Because what you have, if you don't have any recognition and reward, is that you have a research group, someone as a leader gets all the credit in the old system, I would say, or bad system, and the rest is not even cited or even uh, named. And actually what you have at the end is counterproductive result. Nobody wants to go to work, everybody takes a long coffee pause, you know, and, and, and et cetera. You don't really get innovation in anything. So you want to get rid of that. Now, for many people, it has something to do with the title that you want to have. But then you have to ask, what do you want to reach with that title? Do you want the title professor before the name, or do you want specific functions that the professor is performing? So now we have just moved, and we have a very interesting block of a colleague of mine from the, the Dutch um, Royal Academy, the young scientist there, um, about simply, it, it was really like five things which they distilled from the real job description of a professor, what we would like to have with the title of a professor. I, I, can, I can send it to you. The link very, like, very simply explained. So I think this is how a debate we are uh, doing right now is that simply thinking the title, the function descriptions, what we can do and when we, people can be doing it to be satisfied with what they're doing on a daily basis. Uli or, or Shell in terms of sustaining I'm very simple-minded. I think the the key to all this uh, is 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 the, the reward and incentive system. If we, the moment we reward in, and incentivize what what we want, and we heard from Aaron McKeeran today that there is this mismatch between the values that we want and the, what we actually reward. Um, if we if we bring this into uh, into a match. Um, we will, on the one hand, all progress with these with these uh, agendas, and and then they will be sustainable. Yeah. Scientists are smart. I mean, they are they are going for for what uh, how they they want to do their research, but they also want to uh, be successful with make a living, personal living with it. Um, and uh, th th this is this is the mismatch we are having right now. And if we if we are uh, able to um, manage this, I think we'll be, we have reached our goal. We have sustainment through policy. So the new policies that start with forward-looking grants in 2023, uh, the, those go into effect. They start getting progressively more uh, uh, integrated into the proposals and actually start being evaluated in 2025. So there's this gradual approach and then those, those changes will be sustained. Those requirements will be part of the reward system because if you want NASA funding, if you want pay, taxpayer dollars from NASA, you must be practicing the open science as we define it by our policy. But then we're also going further, so the Open Source Science Initiative is now part of the Chief Science Data Office for all of NASA. And again, it's 30 million this year, and then it's 50 million, it increases. And that is to support open science infrastructure, policy, and development. So this is providing funding for open source software libraries, things like that, to sustain, the develop to sustain these projects that are a core part of how we do science. <laughs> You are touching also slightly uh, upon another issue of, you know, having research projects, especially grants for five-year projects, which do not really allow science to sometimes to, to bring the results what we want. And this is also part of the whole reform. We cannot go with that because this is what I know from also myself, colleagues. You get the funding for five years and then stop. And then all the open science, I, I run a blog. What should I do now? I cannot fund it anymore. So it, doesn't make sense. So this, that's why we need a reform. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
Okay, we are at time. I had a couple of other questions, but we will have to do that over happy hour, I guess. Please join me in thanking our wonderful panelists today.